Reading fiction is dangerous. So dangerous that some level-headed people won't do it. I had a college professor like that. He considered fiction frivolous, an extravagant, wasteful pursuit like reality television and video games. If reading fiction is dangerous, rattlesnakes coiled in my high school library one day in the mid-1970s. I was quietly scanning the floor-to-ceiling bookshelves, looking for something likely to read, tracing my index finger across the spines of dozens of books. Then it happened. My finger touched the spine of Rabble in Arms, a 1933 novel by Kenneth Roberts. Had I moved on to the next book, my own history might have been different. But I paused. Then I reached up, tipped the book forward, and pulled it from the shelf. I still remember its appearance and heft. It was hard bound in dark blue cloth, nearly two inches thick, its cream-colored pages tantalized with the promise of serious reading. I opened it, read a few paragraphs, and proceeded to the checkout counter. And that selection made all the difference. In the hours that followed, history changed from black and white to living color. The American Revolution had previously been raw information, names and dates, the stuff of dry history texts and bored lecturers, something to be learned rather than relished. But rabble in arms opened my eyes to the revolution's drama and pageantry, the injustices that inspired a people to seek independence, the yearning for liberty that drove farmers to take up arms against the most powerful nation on earth, and the ideals that gave birth to the world's first constitutional democratic republic. Rather than being frivolous, fiction breathed life into history. From that day on, I have relished good historical fiction, and nonfiction too. They work hand in hand. Historical fiction points to intriguing people and viewpoints that I hadn't previously known or considered. History then adds substance and reality to the fictional stories, providing names and details of those who lived it. And the number of interesting, meaningful, eye-opening stories is just about infinite. A few years after graduating from high school and moving to Georgia, I took a summer job with a timber company in Greensboro. One day while working in Wilkes County, we broke for lunch. The crew boss drove us down the road to a shady spot under some tall trees where we ate our sack lunches. The shady spot turned out to be a place called War Hill, site of the Battle of Kettle Creek in 1779. At the time of my lunchtime visit in 1984, War Hill had been neglected for many years. Thirty-nine years later, I still remember the look of the stunted obelisk monument erected decades earlier in a burst of patriotism. There were some graves dating to long after the battle. The grounds were unkempt and there were no historical markers to explain what had happened there. It was clear that visitors to War Hill were few in number and irregular in frequency. I might have dismissed War Hill that day, choosing instead to remain seated on the tailgate, eating a sandwich and making small talk with co-workers. But ten years earlier, I had selected Rabble in Arms from the library bookshelf. It had shown me the drama of the American Revolution. So that day I walked War Hill, wondering what had happened two centuries earlier. In those pre-internet days, I went to the library in Greensboro to read more about the battle. This is what I learned. In 1779, three years after the Declaration of Independence, Georgia was engaged in a civil war. The people were divided between those loyal to the crown and those determined to break from it. The British, after early setbacks, had reclaimed Savannah and Augusta. Sir James Wright, the royal governor, was on his way back to Savannah to govern. Most of the colony was again under British control. Thus Georgia became the only American colony Britain managed to reclaim after first being expelled. But the British couldn't extinguish revolutionary sentiment in the rebellious colony. At Fort Hurd in what later became Wilkes County, a small group established an emergency capital and installed a governor. And Patriot militia under Andrew Pickens and John Dooley contested British power in Upper Georgia and neighboring upcountry South Carolina. When Patriot fortunes were at their lowest in Georgia in early 1779, 
800 loyalists crossed the Savannah River and entered Georgia from South Carolina. Under the command of Colonel James Boyd, these men were going to Augusta to join the victorious British Army, but none of the 800 were British regulars. They were simply Americans. Prior to reading novels written by Kenneth Roberts, I was aware that the revolution involved loyalists, but only as a point of information. I'd never thought about who they were or why they had remained loyal. No teacher had ever broached the topic. I thought that all Americans opposed Britain and wanted independence. Reading and savoring books like Johnny Tremaine, written in 1943 by Esther Forbes, Rabble in Arms, and another Kenneth Roberts novel, Arundel. Each of these presented the ubiquitous patriot point of view, and I loved them. So I was aware that there were loyalists, but didn't know a thing about them. Then I picked up Oliver Wiswell, yet another Kenneth Roberts novel. This 1940 work of fiction presents the revolution from the view of an American loyalist, where history texts and teachers had been silent about the motives underlying loyalism, Roberts set forth their sentiments and objectives in fascinating detail. His characters weren't just the British or the enemy, they were Americans motivated by principle and conviction, just like the Patriot characters in Rabble in Arms and Arundel. Good historical fiction has a way of doing that, making us think about things we didn't have time to cover in history class. Thanks to good historical fiction, when I visited War Hill in 1984, I understood the tension and fear that permeated the Georgia frontier in 1779. Historical fiction had shown that patriot and loyalist alike were Americans fighting for that in which they believed. We Americans are accustomed to the large armies of World War II and the Civil War. Therefore, 800 Carolina loyalists might not seem impressive, but military strength in the Revolution was measured on a different scale. The British Army that invaded Georgia in 1778, taking Savannah and Augusta, totaled just 3,500 men. Savannah was defended by just 700 patriots who surrendered. The addition of 800 fresh British troops would drastically tip the balance of power in favor of the Redcoats. Tipping the balance of power wouldn't require much. By early 1779, patriot resistance in Georgia had waned to the point of vanishing. There were just a few scattered outposts and detachments, the strongest being 450 Georgia and South Carolina militia in the back country. The Patriot militia caught up with the 800 Loyalists at Kettle Creek in Wilkes County, routing them after a sharp battle. The Loyalists had the larger force, the higher ground, and opened fire first, but they broke when their leader was mortally wounded. In disarray, they fled down the hill and across the creek, chased by Patriots. In the clash, nine Patriots were killed and 23 wounded. The Loyalists lost 70 killed and wounded and 150 taken prisoner. The remainder of the Loyalists dispersed into the swamps and forests. Some returned to the Carolinas. About 270 emerged from the wilderness to join the British near Augusta, becoming the Royal North Carolina Regiment. The Battle of Kettle Creek was a significant Patriot victory and a devastating Loyalist defeat. The British Army could take and hold the South's largest cities, but Kettle Creek demonstrated that Britain didn't control any part of the interior not physically occupied. In the words of Andrew Pickens, the Patriot leader, Kettle Creek was the severest check and chastisement the Tories had in South Carolina or Georgia. Today there is one tribute to Georgia Loyalists. The simple five-sided monument in Danburg in Wilkes County pays homage to the Patriots, the Loyalists, the Confederacy, black Georgians who endured slavery and Jim Crow, and those who served the country in World War I, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. All of them Georgians. All of them Americans. And if you enjoy good history and would like to support historical work like this, please click and subscribe to join our YouTube channel community. Thank you for watching.